Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchmen video broadcast, The Secret of the Seal. is what we're still dealing with this week. We're dealing with the, the symbolism, the meaning of the number 13. Why? Let's go look at our graphics and you'll see on the back of this $1 bill is the obverse and the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States of America. It is supposed to represent what this nation represents. It is written in the language of symbolism and this is a language that a lot of people don't understand but we have we have the Rosetta Stone. We have the key to understand what this language means. It's called the Scriptures, the Bible. That's where we're going to turn to today. We're going to get an understanding of what this number 13 is all about. Take a look at the graphics. You have 13 stars called a constellation uh, there in the cloud. You have 13 letters of E Pluribus Unum, 13 stripes, 13 leaves, 13 olives, 13 arrows. That's on the obverse, the front. And then we look at the back. 13 letters, Anuit Coeptus. Then we have 13 rows of stones. Then we have a date, 1776, and the phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum. We're going to look at that phrase. We're going to understand a little bit about what it means. Some say it means the New World Order. But there's actually, and that phrase is being used a lot, so I, I understand that that has everything to do with what this means. But the literal interpretation of Novus Ordo Seclorum, I'll tell you in a little bit, maybe today, maybe next week, exactly what it means. So let's go back to our Bibles, Revelation chapter 17, because that's where we left off last week with this idea that on the first two um, renderings of the Great Seal of the United States, you had a goddess. A goddess is always representative of something that we see in the Bible, and her name is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But we noted that we don't see a goddess on the back or on the front of the Great Seal of the United States of America. She's hidden that way. So let's look at the scriptures. Revelation 17 verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Think of America the way it is right now. And upon her forehead was a name written. Look at these words. They're all in capital letters. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations, of the earth. Now, I didn't make all of these words in capital letters. If you open up a King James Bible, there it is. It just stands out on the page, Revelation 17. These words just jump out at you. This is her name that's written on her forehead. Can you think of, um, can you think of a of something in the Bible that's on the forehead or in the forehead? It's in, it's in Revelation. 13. And these words, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and Abominations of the Earth, exactly 13 words. That's her title, and she is associated with this number. And we're going to go to the scriptures to find out what her association is, what this number really means. I mean, you know, we kind of have this idea, this, this superstition, this myth, that the number 13 is an unlucky number. I I remember the first time I looked, I was in a uh, hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. I was when I was in college. And I, it dawned on me, I was, I was trying to go up the elevator. I was looking at floor 11, floor 12, floor 14, 15, 16. I'm just going, wait a minute. There's no 13th floor on here. It's not just a myth. It's for some reason... When people make these tall buildings, they put these elevators in, for some reason, a lot of buildings, I wouldn't say all of them, but a lot of buildings don't have a 13th floor. But it never really dawns on anybody that if you're on the 14th floor, you're on the 13th floor. You're there, whether you recognize it or not. But anyway, we have this tradition that the number 13 is an unlucky number, and, and we don't like it. We stay away from the number 13. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the scriptures. We're going to find out exactly what this number means, what it represents, and what its relationship is to all of these 13s that show up. Remember, when we looked at the phrase e pluribus unum, 
They specifically designed the lettering of this phrase. Actually, it should have been ex pluribus lunum. Ex means out of, out of many, one. But they shortened it. That would have been 14 letters. They shortened it deliberately so that it would be exactly 13 letters. What is the significance of it? And why are these 13s all over this seal? What does it mean? I think that this is prophetic. I think this speaks of something that has happened and will happen. So we're going to go to the pages of the Bible. Um, years ago, when I started studying numerics in the Bible, numerology, um, that's, that the phrase itself sort of lends itself to what a lot of Albert Pike and Manley Hall and a lot of other, there's a, there's a, I can't remember, a breed of magic that deals with numerology. Albert Pike in Morals and Dogma uh, devotes several pages in here just dealing with this symbolic meaning of certain numbers. He looks at the number 7, the number 13, 33, and so on. Um, and so they, when I first started studying numbers, I didn't want to because I thought, well, that's, you know, that's Satan worship, that's witchcraft, and I stay away from that. And some people have said that that's what I'm doing when I'm studying numbers in the Bible. But here's the, here's the thing. We, we, we have to realize and recognize that God is a God of order. God is not the author of confusion. That's why you don't find the book of Matthew embedded between Genesis and Exodus. God is a God of order and numbers are always in order. So if you, as you're reading the scriptures, if I were to say give me a number out of the Bible, the first thing people think of is the number seven. Why? Because it's all throughout the pages of the scripture. You have seven days in the week, uh, you have the Sabbath day. God actually named a commandment after this particular number seven. The, another number is the number ten. We have the Ten Commandments. We have ten toes. We have ten horns in the Bible. The number five always shows up. This, David picked up five smooth stones. Why does the Bible go out of its way to do that? And so I, I felt like God was leading me to study numbers. And so I was reading uh, E.W. Bullinger's work on Bible numerics. I read uh, Brother Ed Velo, who's now gone on to be with the Lord. He wrote a book based upon the King James Bible uh, of what he thought Bible numbers meant. They all, all had a list. When I read those two books, I closed them. And I said, Lord, that's what man says. And I'm not denying anything they said. I think they did good work. But Lord, I want to know from the Bible exactly what these numbers mean. And I felt like God was leading me to the Genesis chapter. So the Bible says, test the spirits. So I had Ed Velo's list of what numbers meant, and I went to the Genesis chapter. Ge the number one is the number for beginnings, unity. That's what you see in Genesis chapter one. The number two is the number for division or uh, union. And that's what you see in Genesis chapter 2. You have man who was separated. He had his rib taken out of him. God made a woman, and the two became one flesh. The number three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It deals with sin, but it also deals with the Godhead, Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. And so in Genesis chapter 3, you have the serpent who beguiles Eve, and she has the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The number four deals with the gospel. And you have a picture of the gospel in that Cain is the wicked one who slays his brother Abel, who is righteous, whose blood speaks. That's a picture of the gospel. The number five is the number four, death, but victory over death in the translation or the rapture. Think Enoch, who was translated, did not see death, even though all of his predecessors, the, they're mentioned five times, Adam, go count the number of times Adam's name is mentioned in Genesis 5, and you'll see the fifth time he's mentioned, he dies. And that pattern exists from Adam, Seth, all the way down to Enoch, but Enoch is translated into heaven. The, uh, so what is that number five? The number six uh, represents, um, the number six represents the union of heaven and earth. You have the sons of God and the daughters of men. But the number six also deals with preparation. The number seven is completion. God's finished with it, just like on the Sabbath day. What happens in Genesis 7? In Genesis 7, God ended the world. He, I mean, he did away with it. What did he tell Noah? For yet seven days, and I will destroy the earth. And so it's there. The number eight is the number for new beginnings. In Genesis chapter 8, and I'm running through this because I want you to understand that the number of meanings are in the Genesis chapter. So you have eight people 
who come up, the number eight is the number for new life and new beginnings. Isaac was circumcised on the eighth day. It's a picture of salvation, which is new life. Um, in the grand scheme of history, we believe that the earth will exist 7,000 years, the last thousand years being the day of rest, the Sabbath. On the eighth day, it's a new heaven and a new earth. So in Genesis 8, you have eight people walking off the ark into a new world. Nine's a number for fruit bearing having a baby. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Ten is the number for dominion. In, the first, in Genesis 10, you have the very first king in the world, the first kingdom. It's, it's uh, Nimrod and, and Babylon. The number 11 is the number for confusion. What do you have in Genesis chapter 11? You have confusion of languages. The number 12 is the number for God's promise. Think 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 12 foundations, 12 gates. Then you have uh, the first covenant that God made with Abram is in Genesis chapter 12. Now, whew, now we're in Genesis chapter 13. Let's look at what the Bible is teaching us about this number 13 and how it applies today. If you've never read Genesis 13 with this in mind, we're going to today. Genesis 13, verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. There was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now I want to stop right here because there's a very interesting concept here. Is that God is showing us that there must have been separation between Abram and Lot. And that's exactly what's going on. You understand the idea here. Abram, Abram actually gave Lot everything he had. Abram, Abram had ad, actually adopted Lot. Lot had servants and cattle. Where did they came from? Came from Abraham. And so their herdmen began to strive together over the, wall, over the well waters and over the grazing land and everything else. And rather than Abram, the Bible says, uh, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Rather than Abram saying, you know what, Lot? This is actually my stuff anyway. Get out of here. You go, you go find someplace else to go. This is my land. Rather than Abram doing that, the Bible shows us the meekness and exactly what Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And what Abram did was exhibit meekness. He told Lot, Lot, if you go this way, I'll go that way. Lot, if you go north, I'll go south. If you go, if whatever, well, you pick the place. And whichever you pick, I'll go the other way. That's a picture of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, exhibiting meekness. Now, the first thing that we have going on in Genesis chapter 13, we have a dispute over land. Think of the United States of America. We think of separation. Then we have the introduction. It's the first place in the Bible where we have the introduction of of Sodom and exactly what kind of place it is. Now we're going to see that introduced. We're also going to see where Abram separates from Lot and God gives Abram four things. We'll, we'll look at that, all right? So Genesis 13 verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and behold all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Think of the spiritual idea of that. Verse 13. Genesis 13 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I want you to notice that I have, I want you to look at this again. I want you to notice Genesis 13 verse 13 has exactly 13 words in it. But the men of Sodom, 
5, were wicked and sinners before 10, the Lord exceedingly. 13 words in verse 13 of chapter 13. I think the Bible is in perfect order. I, I promise you it is. Now we're getting an understanding of the partial meaning of the number 13. If you think it's a bad number, you're justified in that. God chose the 13th chapter of the Bible, the 13th verse, 13 words in English to say this exact thing, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And I want you to get this. Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. And, and think about it. Lot chose the well-watered plain. By the way, where Sodom is right now, there ain't a blade of grass for miles of that area. It is an absolute barren wasteland. But the description before God destroyed Sodom was that it was well watered, it had grasslands. Think of Lot choosing, he wants to be near Sodom, he wants to be near a city. Why? He's thinking of the markets. He's thinking that he could be able to trade some of his cattle or sell it in the auctions and the markets and get money from it. And here's an interesting idea. From Genesis 13 to Genesis 19, um, six chapters, you have Lot pitching his tent toward Sodom. By the time we see Lot in Genesis 19, he's living inside of Sodom. So much so that the angels had to literally drag him out of Sodom before God destroyed Sodom. So there's, there's our first primary understanding and picture of the number 13. It does have to do with evil and wickedness and so on. What kind? What does the Bible say? We're going we're gonna to deal with that. But let's look at then at what happened to Abram. Look at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, see the idea of separation. That means coming out. This, you, you don't belong here. You belong here. This is the wickedness of Sodom. God does not appoint us there. He appoints us to be here. And look, so look at what God said. And the Lord said in Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. You know, this just jumps out at me as I'm reading this. I've never really thought of this for the first time. But God told specifically to Lot to lift up his eyes. Think of, um, think of opposites in the Bible. Babylon, in Genesis 11, is in a plain, which is a low spot. He didn't say, look down, that's what I'm going to give you. He said, lift up your eyes. Think about it. The, the fruition or the ultimate fulfillment of what God was giving to Abraham was not merely, although I believe it was included, not merely this land of Canaan that, that exists on the earth. God was show, telling him, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. I want you to think of the number four, we, what we've talked about it. It's not the fourth kingdom, it's the opposite of that. It is, think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what makes it possible because God imputed righteousness into Abram and that was done by the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ in the four Gospels. But think of how this number is fulfilled in the last days. He gives him, he shows him the four directions. He tells him to lift up his eyes and look and he said, that's what I'm going to give you. All that you see, that's what I'm going to give you. Where does north end? Where does south stop? Where does east and west? God said he took our sins and threw them where? As far as east is from west. Just think about it. It is an infinite concept. It never ends. Think of eternity. Think of heaven and the kingdom of heaven. So you're getting an idea of what this number is all about. Because we look in Jeremiah chapter 51, God now brings in, that we have the idea of Abram coming out from Lot, coming out from the men of Sodom, and that number 13, Abram coming out of that. And we have scriptures to back that up. Jeremiah 51 verse 6, Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. And he will render unto her a recompense. I mean, he's going to pay him back 
Revelation 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, I want to stop right here. I want you to think of what God did to Sodom, what God is going to do with Babylon. God, what God did to Sodom was rain sulfur, literally brimstone down from heaven, and it burnt that city to ashes. And nobody lives there anymore. God's going to do the same thing with Babylon. He's going to burn her. The, the smoke is going to rise up from Babylon. And the merchant, the Bible says, talks about the merchants of the sea are going to see the smoke of her burning. And they're going to lament and they're going to mourn and weep after her. Why? Because she was good business. That's why they're going to do it. That's why, that's why the fellows uh, that Paul dealt with, Paul was teaching everybody, hey, you can go to heaven without idols. And the craftsmen who were making idols and who were making a ton of money selling them in the markets, for what? For Diana worship. They were, they were put out because Paul was trying to destroy the power of Babylon through the goddess Diana. Anyway, back to the scriptures. Here's what else God tells us. If we are the children, the seed of Abraham, God always teaches us, separation. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Here God is teaching I think all of this is prophetic. I think it's literal. I think it meant something in Paul's day. I think it means something today. And I think it's prophetic. The, the Bible, the Apostle Paul is teaching us about Babylon. Come out of Babylon. Don't be a partaker with her. What communion? God is light. Babylon is darkness. They dwell in the, sh in the valley of the shadow of death. Um, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? No, no, no. What concord hath Christ? What, what contract does Christ have with Belial, the devil? Do you remember the 40 days in the wilderness? The devil tried to get Jesus into a concord. I used to drive one of those, AMC Concord, when I was in college. No, no, not, not, not that kind of concord. The devil tried to get Jesus in a contract with him, a covenant and I want you to think about that because there is a covenant mentioned in the scriptures that looks like this. I'll, sh I'll show it to you when we get there. But he tried to get Jesus into a covenant and Jesus three times rebuked him with scripture. Think of the three things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. See, numbers are important in the Bible. They give us wisdom. They show us the order and the pattern of God. How many times was Christ tempted? three times. Now think about this. The serpent goes to Eve in the Old Testament, gives her three things, and she falls to the temptation. That's because the Old Testament is weak. The devil then goes to Jesus, the, new, the second Adam, the new man from heaven, tempts him three times. Jesus succeeds where Adam failed. Isn't that beautiful? Well, praise the Lord. I see, see, that's the order that's the order that God has placed inside of his scripture. But he tells us to come out from among them and be, be you separate. And then he says, touch not the unclean thing. Now it specifically says the unclean thing. I don't know that I know exactly what that is. But I think that there is a prophecy here. And I think something unclean is going to appear in this world and everybody in the world is going to want to touch it. They want to be a part of it. And God tells us, if you don't touch that, I will be your father and you shall be my sons and daughters. I will be your God and you shall be my people. But if you touch it, 
If you have anything to do with it, I am not your daddy, and you will not inherit the kingdom. So just kind of think about that. Now, let's look at, so we understand the idea of the number 13 being a representation of, number one, all of the wickedness and evil that's in the earth. It represents Sodom, it represents Babylon, her, that's what it said all throughout there, be not partakers of her sins, and so on. Uh, we have the idea of separation from Babylon. And I will say that the more that our nation, with all of these 13s, the more we become like Babylon, the more we become like Sodom. I'm a patriot. I love my country. I love um, the freedoms that we have. I love the land. I love the place that I live. I love... I love a lot of things about America, but the America that we have now is not the America that my forefathers grew up in and helped build. It's not the same one. And at some point, my country and all these 13s are going to pitch their tent towards Sodom. I have to come out from that and be separate from that. I can't just say, well, we can't break up the country, so I guess we'll just go along. That's how some people are seeing this right now, and I'm not there. I think God at some point, he's not doing it now, but I think God at some point is going to call his people out of the nonsense and the wickedness that is in this nation. And I guarantee you, he's not going to call us out with guns in our hands. Now, I believe in defending property. I believe in defending freedom and nations and everything like that. But I think God is going to give us greater weapons than our rifles. All right? Just a little thought here. But I believe in, I believe in the separation. All right? Now, here's another theme that goes along with what the number 13 represents. It has to do with love. And I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you from the scriptures, all right? And, and there's two types of love. There is pure love, where you love somebody like a child unconditionally. I love my children. I love my grandchildren unconditionally. My, my grandchildren, they're all babies now. They're all young. They don't have to do anything for Papa. They just have to look cute. And I love them, including the one that's already in heaven. I never laid a hand on her, never touched her, never held her in my arms. She was sick from the moment she was born, even before that. And she lived five weeks on this earth, and literally my heart was torn to pieces when she took in her last breath and went to be with Jesus. I love her unconditional love. That's God's love. That's pure love. There's another love. It's harlot love. Harlots don't do what they do because they love people. They don't feel like they're giving themselves over to a service to benefit mankind. They don't do it for free. They do it for a price, for a hire, for money. And a, the sad thing is, a lot of people in this country, in this world, will sell themselves out to that for a fake and phony love. That as long as you have the money, I will love you. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, let's look at Babylon. Did you know that the word Babylon in the King James Bible is mentioned 236 times? That is 13 times 22. Exactly. Babylon, that word Babylon. Type it in. Get our software, purebiblesearch.com. Download it for Windows, Linux, or Mac. And install it and type in just the word Babylon. Look through it in the whole scripture. 236 times. 13 times 22. Here's what's interesting. The word mystery, which is part of her name. Mystery, Babylon. The word mystery is mentioned 22 times in the Bible. You multiply 13 and 22, you get Babylon. So, and let's look again. Revelation 17, 5. Mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 13 words. Genesis 13, verse 13, you have 13 words. And the men of Sodom were wicked, exceeding before the Lord, or whatever it says. All right? So we had this idea of harlot love being associated with the number 13. Look, and, and, and God warned us. Solomon. Solomon, who I'm sure was very familiar with how women were. Why? Because he had a thousand of them. Seven of them were wives. Three hundred women that Solomon had 
that all he had to do was snap his fingers and he'd be in bed with them. And why, and why did God do that? Why did God allow Solomon to have all that? God allowed Solomon to have everything that a man could lust for in this world. He had money, he had power, he had, um, he had the nations of the earth come and paying taxes to him. He had wine. He had, he had, when you have a thousand women, you literally have probably every type of woman that there is that man can lust after in this world. And Solomon had every one of them. Forty years he reigned on the throne. And at the end of his life, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes and he said, that was a huge waste. It's vanity. It's vexation. It, it turns into nothing. Solomon lamented all of those years that he spent wasting in sin and debauchery. And so Solomon gives us a little bit of wisdom concerning this harlot woman. He calls her the strange woman. The idea of strange means you can't really know who she is. She is a stranger. You can't understand her. That's mystery Babylon, people. Proverbs 2, verse 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Now we skip to verse 16. What's it going to keep us from? To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger, which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Think about that. She hates the Bible. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. The path of life and um, the, uh, the covenant of God is this Bible. She hates this Bible. She has forsaken the covenant of God. Her house will take you to death, and she will cause you to not take hold of of the paths of life that are in this Bible. That's who all of this represents. Mystery Babylon the Great, the strange woman. Now look in Proverbs chapter 5. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. See the Masonic emblem there? That's Mystery Babylon. And her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood. Think of Revelation 8. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. See? She is a strange woman. She is not. She does not want anybody figuring her out. Everything that she does, everything, every move she makes is a concealment. So I open up uh, Morals and Dogma, written by, hey, 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 Fat Albert Pike. Can't get my fingers to work here. And it says in the front here, next to this old geezer looking Fat Albert Pike, esoteric book for Scottish Rite use only. Only the elite can know what's inside this book. And it says, uh, to be returned upon withdrawal or, or death of recipient, the widow of a mason is supposed to turn in everything that he had of masonry, his, um, his lambskin apron, his medallions, his copy of Morals and Dogma. She was supposed to turn those in. I went to a bookstore in Van Buren, Arkansas. You got anything on masonry? He turned around, went behind him. He said, yeah, I got this right here. It was Morals and Dogma. 20 bucks. Got it for 20 bucks, okay? Some widow didn't do what she was supposed to do, and I ended up with the book. That's Mystery Babylon. She is strange. She does not want anybody. She's esoteric. Does not want anybody to know what she's up to, what her plans are. That's why her name is Mystery. Proverbs chapter 7. This is an interesting passage. Solomon says he was watching out of his window one night and he saw a young man walking through town. And he walked by where the harlot lived. You think he knew what neighborhood he was in? I guarantee you he did. He was walking by the neighborhood of the strange woman and he's watching this young man go in unto her. Solomon wrote this down. Look at verse 24, Proverbs 7. You can read the whole story there. Solomon said, Hearken unto me now, therefore, you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Decline to her ways, not incline. We incline to the ways of God. We decline to the ways of God the strange woman. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. 
That's who she represents. That's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and all this number thir- this is This is where we're going. I think that we are sealed to this doom and this destruction. Now look at Isaiah. This is interesting. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 21. How has the faithful city become an harlot? He's talking about Jerusalem. It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murders. Isaiah 23, 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten. Seventy years according to the days of one king, after the end of seventy years, shall Tyre sing as an harlot. Look at the picture. Look at verse 16. Take an harp. Go about the city, thou harlot that hast been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. Think of all the harlots that sing all of these songs. Katy Perry talk, sings the song called uh, You're a Firework. And it's all about the spark of divinity that needs to come out. And in this video, she's got two guys kissing one another. Sodom. She's the harlot that sings the songs of Mystery Babylon. Mm -mm. Boy, this, this Bible is right in everything. It, the only thing this Bible left out is the picture of Katy Perry. Why? Because she's not the only one throughout history. Read your Bible. Study history. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 16. This is what harlot love is all about. Harlots won't do anything except they get something in return out of it. Back in the Old Testament, you see Judah sleeping with, it was actually his daughter-in-law, although he thought she was a harlot, and he slept with her. He didn't know that he had conceived inside of her his two sons, uh, Perez and Zerah. But he goes, he goes home, comes back into town with a goat, and I don't remember what all else, to give her. She wasn't going to do that for free. That's how harlots are. They'll love you. As long as you pay them well, as long as you take care of them, as long as you give them higher. Think of hireling pastors. Pastors who don't really love the flock. They don't love the sheep. They won't do what they're supposed to do. Take care and tend the flock of God, which God has made them overseers. They won't do that. They only, they'll do that so long as the church pays them well. That's a hireling. Harlots love for hire. The love of money, people, is the root of all evil. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 41. They shall burn thine houses with fire and execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women. And I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou also shalt give no hire any more. Down in verse 48, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Now he's bringing Sodom into the deal. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her hand and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Let me, let me just talk about what's, um, what's in America right now. You see, this is actually, Ezekiel 16 is Jerusalem. You go study this out. And God tells about what happened to Jerusalem. God took her, cleaned her up, fell in love with her, said, I'm going to marry you. He, put, he adorns her. This is why I believe that it's okay for women to wear certain adornments. Because the husband, I believe the husband should do that. And I, I buy my wife stuff to wear. Okay? Not dresses, because she don't let me do that. Okay? But anyway, I, I, I think it's okay. God attired Jerusalem. Put her in nice silk, gave her nice earrings, put a jewel on her head. I mean, he made her smell and look good. And what'd she do with it? She went out and laid down before everybody that came along. She used the beauty that God had given her to harlot herself out. Think of America. God blessed this nation. God brought people into this nation preaching the gospel. The gospel goes from here all over the world. And God gave us a plenteous land. But what are we doing? We've hired ourselves out as the United States of America. It's, it's awful. But he says, here's, here's your sister Sodom. Here, this was her real sin. 
sodomy, in other words, men and men and women and women, are the fruits or the byproduct or the results of the original sin of Sodom. What was it? Number one, it was pride. What do we, what, what do we say when the towers came down in New York City? We have American pride. We're going to rebuild it. We're going to do better. We are proud Americans. That's our first problem. Americans think that they're the greatest and that nobody, everybody in the world should want to be like us. And they don't. I promise you, they don't. Number two, fullness of bread. When you have too much to eat, you don't have to actually go out and work for it because then he brings in idleness. When people sit around and watch TV and play video games for, I'm talking, hours on end, that means we have too much laziness and idleness in this nation. When we have gotten so good as Americans that we cannot mow our own grass, we cannot fill our own gas tank, we cannot wash our own windows. We cannot vacuum our own floor. We can't do anything for ourselves. We can't grow our own vegetables. We can't do anything for ourselves. That's going to bring, and what has that done? As we have advanced as a civilization and a society in this country with all of our advancements, all of the things that make our jobs easier. My forefathers grew up with a, a tote sack in one hand, and I don't know what they used in the other, but they talked about chopping cotton. Pulling cotton off and putting it in the bag and toting that bag around all day long in that summer heat and then chopping the stalks when they were done with it and selling that for just a very small amount of money. Just enough money to get by. That was the America that was great. And I guarantee you, these people went to bed early at night. Why? They didn't have strength left in them to get in into any kind of mischief or nonsense. But let me tell you, and it mentions here they didn't strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Let me tell you something. It is a shame, it is wrong to just give poor people money. You know what they do? They sit around and have idleness. But the mind and the body can only sit around for so long. It looks for something to do with itself. This is where all of the fornication and all of the wickedness comes in. God gave us work more as a blessing than anything else because as long as we're working, we're not sinning. But America is being turned over to a nation of idleness, a nation that is full of... We've got buffets everywhere. A nation of, of, of idleness, a nation of pride. And so now what are we seeing? We're seeing sodomy grow just like a fungus all over this country. This, this is the number of Sodom. This is the number of Babylon. And this is where the United States is headed. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now we're going to look at the opposite. I mentioned all this. This is harlot love. This is, I will do for you as long as you do for me. Believe it or not, that's what a lot of marriages and relationships are built upon. They're built upon, I will do for you as long as you do for me. That's not pure love. That's not undefiled love. That's not God's love. God offers and loves and gives without any expectation of return whatsoever. We actually have a story in the Bible. Go read... Um, Hosea. God told Hosea to go out and marry a harlot. And that harlot was a, was a picture of Israel. And Hosea goes out just following the commandments of God, but he actually falls in love with her. And he marries her. And he has hopes of building something in her and turning her life around and making her something that she never was. And next thing you know, there's two kids in the house that don't look like Hosea. And all of a sudden now, Mama's gone. Gomer sends the kids out. Go find your mom. They come back. Dad, we found her. She's in the markets being sold. You know what Hosea did? Went and bought her. Paid the price. Think of Christ. And now that Hosea has come back, or excuse me, that Gomer the harlot has come back, she has a new nature and a new life. I believe God can even save harlots. That's what I believe. Rahab was one, and God saved her. Just think about... Anyway, 
That's pure love. Hosea had unconditional love for Gomer. He loved her and put up with all of her flirting around. Even so much so that when she was found in the markets being sold, he wasn't going, Ah, you get what you deserve. Hey, you run around on me. <laughs> I tell you. He looked at her and he said, I love her. How much? Well, it's going to cost you $1,000. I'll pay it. That's my wife and I love her. That's unconditional love. Isn't it interesting? The greatest chapter in the whole Bible that talks about, and the King James uses the word charity, and that's exactly what it, it describes God's pure love. Charity is where we get the word care from. All right? It describes charity. It's 1 Corinthians 13, and 1 Corinthians 13 has exactly 13 verses in it. He's teaching you about the pure love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself uh, unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Then we pick it up in verse 8. See, it has 13 verses in it. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. Think of Paul being a Jew in the, under the Old Testament. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Thirteen verses, thirteenth chapter. It's the pure love of God. Now I'm going to show you, there's actually a picture of this in the Bible, associated with the number thirteen. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. The exact phrase, love of God, is exactly 13 times in your King James Bible. Get the software and look it up. 13 times exactly the phrase, love of God. And how was the love of God manifested to mankind? He says it there that he sent his only begotten son into the world. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So think about what the definition of pure love is. It's giving. Now, giving in expectation of return is not giving. It's trading. It's hiring. That's this love. God's pure love. God gave His only begotten Son to who? Just the good people? It's not what it says. To the world. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Love is giving. When we give things to our children, that they did not deserve. We did so because we loved them. My mother, I used to, I hate needles. That's why I have no tattoos. That's one of the reasons. I don't like needles. Never did. Okay? I give blood now, every now and then. I'm just going, oh, hurry up. When I was a little boy, she took me to the doctor to get a shot. And she promised me, now if you're good, don't throw a fit. I'll buy you an ice cream. Oh, I'm all for that. So I got in there, and that doctor came in with a needle that was about that long and came racing toward me. And as soon as he got toward me, I started pitching a fit and throwing a temper tantrum and flailing all about and screaming, so much so that I knocked the needle 
out of the doctor's hands and it shot all over the walls. He cursed, went back and got another one and gave me a shot. My mom bought me ice cream afterward. Why? She loves me. She still does. She's put up with the very worst of my coggard. And she loves her son. I love my children. I've seen my children do wonderful things. I've seen my children do bad things. And I love them unconditionally. That's pure love. So think about what it says. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I want you to see a picture of this. You're going to see the number 13. Matthew chapter 5 verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Stop right here. How many disciples were there? Not ten. Twelve. Twelve disciples. When they come to Jesus, how many are there in the group? Thirteen. God so loved the world that he gave. The number twelve is the number for promise. So you have the 12 disciples, you have the 12, by the way, it's the 12 tribes too. He loves the 12 tribes. And he's going to be part of them. When you have, we, and we, this, we looked at this, when you have the 12 tribes, when you have the, um, the, the 12 divisions uh, around the, the, um, the tabernacle, you have the tabernacle in the middle. Here's Christ in the midst of his disciples. There's 13 people walking around preaching the gospel everywhere, telling everybody that God loves you unconditionally. All he asks you to do is to receive that love and believe his word and believe in, the, believe in the one whom he sent, which was Jesus Christ. Now look at this, Ephesians chapter 2. Now, now I'm fixing to get serious. I'm going to read a verse of scripture and I'm going to show you some graphics up on the screen. And I'm telling you, that, and I'm, I'm fixing to make some people very unhappy with some things that I'm going to say. We've been, I haven't quite dealt with the meaning of this pyramid yet, but I'm going to. And I can tell you that the symbolism of the pyramid on the seal, the back of the one dollar bill, and the pyramids of Egypt, and pyramids, I don't care if they were the, the, the high places uh, in Israel or the, uh, the mounds. We have, we have Indian mounds just across the river in Cahokia, Illinois. There are mounds, when the, when the settlers came into this country, they found mounds everywhere. They were high places. Down in uh, Mexico, down in, um, in South America, these pyramids are everywhere down there. I, I even believe there's one in Bosnia. There's a, you can look it up. There's this humongous mountain that is shaped exactly like a pyramid that's been covered over with dirt, and it's got trees and grass. I'm going, I think that was a pyramid. I think it was a high place. And I can tell you that the symbol of this pyramid is as far away from the truth of the gospel as there is. There is no connection between the pyramid and the symbolism of the pyramid and God's kingdom. It doesn't exist. It's not there. This is the opposite of God's kingdom. So let me, let's look at something here. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. So think about it. You have 12 stones laid as the foundation. This is what we, as the church, are built upon. See, Jesus wasn't kidding. He was talking to Peter and the disciples, upon this rock I will build my church. And we have the church built upon the foundation of the 12 apostles, plus Jesus being, now he's mentioning this foundation, Jesus Christ being the chief corner stone. The corner stone is always at the foundation, not at the top, because that's exactly what he's describing here. He's, he said the foundation is being laid right now of the apostles and the prophets of the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ, number 13, is the chief apostle. He's the chief bishop. He's the chief shepherd. He is the um, angel of the Lord. He is every office and position that there is in the Bible. Jesus is the number one of it. All right? He is the prophet. He is the apostle. He is the bishop. He is the shepherd. He is all of these things. And he is at the foundation of the building, which is the house of God, the church. And he is the chief 
corner stone. So I'm going to show you something. It's the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of mystery Babylon the Great. And the kingdom of God, remember when God told Abraham to look northward, southward, eastward, and westward? Remember when he said that? Four places. It was a prophecy of new Jerusalem which comes down from heaven. Look at the verse. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. That's what New Jerusalem looks like. It looks like a cube, a square. It is built four square, which means that it has four squares in it. It has the, the length and the breadth and the height are equal. It is, we call that when we have a number like 16, we put the number 3 next to it on the top there. That means 16 squared. That's how you find, what is it, the area of a square? It's A times B times C. I and mean, just think about what, what the Bible's telling you. New Jerusalem is a cube. I'm hearing from people that, oh no, I think New Jerusalem's a pyramid. Number one, that's not what the Bible says. Number two, I, sus I have a suspicion on where that came from because it didn't come from the Bible. And I, this is what I see. I see that New Jerusalem, the kingdom that God gives to mankind with His pure love, the 12 foundation stones and Christ being the chief cornerstone is the exact opposite and diametrically opposed to the kingdom of Mystery Babylon the Great with the unfinished pyramid with 13 rows of stones on it waiting for, it's unfinished, it's incomplete. What did Jesus say when he was on the cross? It is finished. My work is done. That's the kingdom of God. This work is unfinished. It needs man's work and man's doing to bring the accomplishment of the missing piece, the Eye of Horus, as the capstone on top of the pyramid, not the corner stone of Jesus Christ. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What communion hath light with darkness. This book is open to everybody. This book is closed to everybody. This is four square. This is the pyramid. Decide whose side you're going to be on. Now I'm going to show you something. Back in the um, mid to late 1800s, there was a, um, uh, a lot of um, teaching going on about the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And a lot of people, some guys from England and so on, were traveling there doing all the measurements and taking a look at everything. And they were inventing doctrine. They were trying to say that uh, the pyramid was, was actually built, uh, some say it was built by Moses, some say it was built by Enoch, it's the pillar that Enoch built, which the Bible says nothing about. Not one word. Uh, but anyway, there's all this um, ascribing of the Israelites actually being the builders of the Great Pyramid. This is what was going around in the mid to late 1800s. In jumps a man by the name of Charles Taze Russell. You know who that is? He's the founder of the Jehovah's Witness cult. Charles Taze Russell grew up in church and he kept hearing sermons on hell. And he said, I don't believe that. That's, I, I don't want to think about that. And I'll, I'll just say this, people who don't want to go to hell will, will do two things. Either, number one, they'll fall upon Christ and say, God, I don't want to go to hell. Or they'll just simply say, I don't believe in it. So one of the, one of the mainstay doctrines of the Jehovah's Witness cult is, hell, schmell, that doesn't really exist. That's the grave. Everybody knows that. He's changing the Bible to get it. So Charles Taze Russell had this, had this deluded concept of what hell was, of who Jesus was, he was not the divine God became flesh. Charles Taze Russell didn't believe that. 
So he, he's, he's going to launch this, this uh, thing where he's going to try to straighten everybody's doctrine out. So he issues a book called The Divine Plan of the Ages. One of the concepts that Charles Taze Russell had was, was that God, and this comes to me from Brother Brady Crumb, who uh, preaches here at Bethel. Um, uh, he loves the Lord, loves the King James Bible. He's saved by God's grace. He had always told me, Mike, the Jehovah's Witness teach in what's called progressive revelation, that in different series, in different ages of time, God had a different revelation for those people. And the Jehovah's Witness cult built themselves. Taze Russell's idea was, was that God had selected him in this new age to bring out the true understanding of Scripture. Not what everybody else said for 2,000 years that just believed the Bible and preached it. I've got a new revelation for a new age. A new time. And so Taze Russell taught that there was a new revelation in different ages of the world. And he used the pyramid to prove it. So, Taze Russell comes out with this book called The Divine Plan of the Ages. He reissues the book after he learns all this information about the pyramid. He reissues the book. Here it is right here. The Divine Plan of the Ages as shown in the Great Pyramid. Now I want you to notice there's a chart in Taze Russell's book showing God's progressive revelation, new revelations in different ages. I'm going to give you a close-up of this chart. Notice that he talks about the dispensation first, the second dispensation, uh, the third dispensation, and notice that the pyramid is a little bit higher built in each dispensation. And notice that up at the top there where it says dispensation first, dispensation second, the Jewish age, the gospel age. Notice there underneath the gospel age you have the capstone with the radiant glory coming out of it. That was supposed to be Christ. He said that Christ, not the chief cornerstone, he was the capstone at the top of the pyramid. And that the pyramid, look, look at this. The pyramid had to wait to be built up so it could reach the capstone, which he said was Jesus. That's a lie. Jesus is not the capstone. He's the chief corner stone. According to the King James, that's what the King James Bible says. Taze Russell had a problem with the King James Bible. Didn't say what he wanted it to say. So he used it for a while, and people were given, people who followed the Jehovah's Witness idea, were given a list of all the places in the Bible that they should scratch out of their Bible. I um, can't remember the guy's name who taught on this. He actually had a copy of it. It was Jehovah's Witness, the King James Bible, but they had a list of all the places in the Bible that they were to scratch out because Taze Russell said, that's not really what the Bible really says. And I'm telling you what it really says. Jesus is not God. Hell is not on fire. And you have nothing to worry about because if you miss, uh, if you miss it in this age, you'll get it in the next. And he used the idea of ages and dispensations to teach it. Then comes along a fellow by the name of Clarence Larkin. And I know I'm fixing to make some people very upset. But I, I do this in love. I'm saying this. I have wept over whether or not I should talk about this. It has made me ill. The, the day that I've discovered all of this information, I was sick. I, I didn't, Lord, I don't, I don't know if I can say this. I don't know if I can do this. Because there are many people who have based their belief on end times and even their belief on, in certain doctrines upon what Darby said, Schofield said. Schofield, Schofield at the, in the introductory page of Schofield's first edition of his notes that, that is in the King James Version, he says he owes a, a gratitude to Westcott and Hort 
for encouraging a greater understanding of the original languages. Westcott and Hort, those guys hated the King James Bible. But you've built a doctrine based upon Darby, Schofield, Clarence Larkin, Dallas Seminary, Peter Ruckman, all of these other men, you've built your, you've, you've, this is our doctrine, this is what these guys say, this is what we believe. I love you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you facts. That's what I'm going to give you, facts. You decide what you want to do with it. You decide if you're going to be angry with me because I'm telling you facts, and I'll let you decide on whether it's right or wrong or not. Fair enough? We shouldn't be afraid of the truth, should we? And I'm just going to give you facts. Charles Taze Russell issues The Divine Plan of the Ages. That was the name of his book because it had the idea that in different ages, God had different gospels, different ideas, different revelations. That at one time it was this way, now it's a totally different way. That's what Taze Russell, that's what the Hope Jehovah's Witness cult still teaches. Now comes Clarence Larkin who writes dispensational truth. And what that means is, is that in each different dispensation, there is a different truth. That is not what the scripture says. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the spirit of Christ that is in us now the apostles revealed that the Spirit of Christ was in those men in the Old Testament. Paul even said that the rock that followed them in the wilderness was our rock, Jesus Christ. That the bread that they ate in the wilderness was the same bread that you and I eat. It was spiritual manna. Their problem was that it wasn't mingled with, with, with belief. But Larkin stated that in different dispensations, there was a different, in some cases, an opposite truth. I've heard some. Now, I know that there are differences and degrees of dispensationalism. And let me tell you what I believe. I believe that the Old Testament was part of God's plan. It led up to the New Covenant. The word dispensation is used four times in the scriptures, and Paul used it in this way, that a dispensation of the gospel had been given to me. In other words, God dispensed the, the teaching and the doctrine of grace. Was Paul the only one that had that? No. Peter had it. James had it. John had it. They all taught the same thing. They all taught one gospel. And so I understand that there are some who are way out on the extreme. There are churches who say, we don't believe anything but what the Apostle Paul said. And they, they call it dispensational idea. Now, Again, I don't want to make anybody mad. Let me present to you the facts. Here's some graphics that Charles Taze Russell put in his book, The Divine Plan of the Ages. And I want, you, I want to show you that Clarence Larkin used the same graphics concerning the pyramid. There's Taze Russell's graphic on the, on the left, Clarence Larkin's graphic on the right. They both um, assimilated or assumed the idea that the Great Pyramid was at the geographic center of the world and thus God was showing that that means that the Great Pyramid was built by godly people and it meant to show all of these different dispensations. If we go back to the graphic that, that Taze Russell made, that's what he's talking about. In the name of the book, The Divine Plan of the Ages, was dispensationalism as shown in the Great Pyramid. If you get a copy of Dispensational Truth, you can actually download a free version from various websites on the internet. You can see exactly what I'm saying, that Clarence Larkin, toward the end of Dispensational Truth, wrote an entire chapter dealing with the Great Pyramid, saying that it proved the idea of different dispensations and different ideas in different ages. And so now, this information that Clarence Larkin had, that Charles Taze Russell had, actually comes from an earlier source. A fellow by the name of Joseph Seiss, 1877, wrote a book called Miracle in Stone. Seiss was a dispensationalist who used the pyramid to, quote, prove that God had different doctrines and plans for different ages. And so this is what, if we look back at the graphic again, this is what Taze Russell 
came up with that God had different ideas and different gospels and different doctrines for different ages. And it's exactly what Clarence Larkin said. It is known that science inspired Taze Russell in his theories of progressive revelations and in using the pyramid to predict the second coming of Christ. The question is, was Clarence Larkin inspired by Sykes, Taze Russell, or both? Both Russell and Larkin teach that there are two separate Gospels. One for the Gentiles, which is pure grace alone. One for the Jews, which is based on works. What is Taze Russell's doctrine? Taze, Charles Taze Russell taught the Jehovah's Witness cult teaches that there is a special class of God's people, the 144,000, who get to inherit the kingdom of heaven based upon God's grace. Then there is a subclass, the standard run-of-the-mill, door-knocking Jehovah's Witness, who are being told that if they maintain works, that God will give them a part in his kingdom. They will never get to go to heaven, but they will exist on the earth throughout all of eternity. Very similar to the idea that there are two distinct contradictory gospels. One that says we are saved by grace. One that says that Israel, the Jew, is going to be saved, kind of, as long as they do works of the law and believe at the same time. That's two Gospels. Paul the Apostle in the book of Galatians denounced and decried any Gospel, any other Gospel that had works attached to it. Taze Russell believed it. Clarence Larkin believed it. And there are people all over the world who are teaching it as the gospel truth. Now, all of this, what Sykes believed, who wrote in the mid-1800s, around 1850, 18, what, what date did I say? Uh, 1877. Sykes wrote it first. Taze Russell picked it up. Larkin picked it up. Larkin actually quotes Sykes in Dispensational Truth. So we know that he got it from there. Did he get some of his concepts from Clarence Lark or Taze Russell? I don't know. I know that Charles Taze Russell lived uh, in Pennsylvania. Clarence Larkin lived in Pennsylvania. Larkin comes after Taze Russell. I don't know that Russell's ideas were anything that Larkin built upon. But we know it came from Sykes. Both of them did. So here's the thing. All of this dispensational idea and these different ages is based upon the idea that we are right now in one age that they call a dispensation, even though the Bible never uses that term in that way. That we are in a certain age, and Larkin says it, and here, here's what Larkin did in Dispensational Truth. You go get a copy of it and read it for yourself. He did exactly what Seiss did. He did exactly what Taze Russell did. He tried to, to show that the Great Pyramid actually showed all these dispensations and that it was proving by the, the metrics and the measurements of the Great Pyramid that the second coming, was going to, second coming of Christ was going to occur in such and such year. Larkin did it, Russell did it, Seiss did it. They all were trying to use the pyramid as sort of an oracle to give them the day and the hour of the, re of the Lord's return. Because they said the pyramid points us to a new age. We know it in the occult. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's what the Aquarian conspiracy is all about. It's the idea in the New Age movement that we are, we are in the Piscean Age, the two fishes, and the uh, universe is spinning around, the stars are lining up, and we're about ready to go into a new age of peace and health, and everybody's going to live forever, and there'll be gods, and there's no, no more war. It's, a, it's basically just a, um, a corruption of the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
The Inquiring Conspiracy is all about that. Notice the symbol. We have um, the New King James Version. Oh, it's bringing about change. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Even the Masons base themselves upon this same idea that there is coming in the future a new age. The Masons used to publish a magazine called the New Age. They believed that there was going to come a time when the temple was going to be rebuilt and men were going to become better. What is Masonry's, Masonry's logo? Making good men better. They believed that that time was going to come in a new age and they all had the idea that the pyramid pointed toward the age of Horus, the capstone on top of the pyramid. Again, your King James Bible says zero about Christ being the capstone on a pyramid. There's even the teaching amongst those who follow Larkin and Darby and Schofield and some of these others that the universe itself is in the, is in the shape of a pyramid. The Bible says nothing about it. They believe that New Jerusalem is shaped like a pyramid. Larkin believed it. Um, Russell believed it. Russell believed it so much that he ordered that at, his, at the foot of his gravesite in, in uh, Pittsburgh or outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that they erect a monument to him that was a pyramid with the capstone sitting on top of it. He was looking for a new age of enlightenment, a new age of Horus that was going to be built upon the earlier dispensations. In astrology, ast astrology has the 12 signs, actually, but we remember, we mentioned there's 13 constellations in there based upon the lunar months. And that um, each sign of the zodiac circle, take a look at the graphic, each sign of the zodiac circle moves one degree every 72 years. Thus from one age to the next is a period of 2,160 years. I'll explain this. From, from the day of the beginning of the Piscean Age to the day of the beginning of the Aquarian Age is 2,160 years. So let's imagine that we are close to the end of the um, Piscean Age and we have but one degree for the for the world to turn to reach the first degree of the Aquarian age. That period is 72 years. Go back to the graphic. The 72 stones in the pyramid denote the procession of stars from one age to the next. In the occult, in the esoteric mystery religions that base themselves upon the pagan temple of the pyramid, they say that the reason why, the, here's what Manley Hall said, Manley Hall said the 72 stones in that pyramid on the great seal. What does it mean? It means that it points to the coming of a new age of Horus. A new birth is going to take place, a new age of enlightenment. So, Larkin writes his book, Dispensational Truth. The subtitle of the book is called God's Plan and Purpose in the Ages. Do you remember what Taze Russell's book was called? God's Divine Plan for the Ages. There is a similarity here, but it goes beyond that. Here is, this is a graphic of Taze Russell's book, The Divine Plan of the Ages and his chart of dispensations. Here is a dispensational preacher, I'll not mention his name, who is drawing on his board, he's teaching these dispensational ideas, trying to show that the universe is a pyramid and that God's divine plan for the ages. You see that banner there? That's from the same video. This, I don't know where he got this, this long uh, chart from, but the chart is called the divine plan of the ages where he's teaching that there is a different revelation in different times uh, uh, throughout man's history including the, uh, the, the uh, gap theory a, a whole world that shows up before Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 which the Bible says nothing about whatsoever 
And this dispensational teacher is teaching you that you have to believe that God has different contradictory truths throughout the ages. He's got one now and he's got one coming that's going to be totally different than what you and I believe right now. And this is from, they say this is from God's word. And it's not. It's the idea of using the pyramid to teach that there is a new age coming of enlightenment and that the capstone is going to show up one of these days. Clarence Larkin did not like the King James Bible in certain places. And here's, what's, here's what I don't understand. You have churches that say 1611 King James Version and they're King James only. And yet they teach for the gospel truth the doctrines and the Bible corrections of Schofield, Darby, and Clarence Larkin, and Dallas Seminary. And I'm going to show you from Clarence Larkin's own words that he didn't like what the Bible said and he didn't believe what the Bible said. He was trying to bring in his intellect as a master over the words of God rather than the words of God being the master over his intellect. Let me show you what he said. This is from Larkin's Dispensational Truth. God says Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Larkin says there is no cornerstone, only a capstone. This is how the NIV renders the word cornerstone. In the NIV, they, don't, they didn't like the word capstone or cornerstone either, so they took it out and put in capstone. That's what the NIV did. Where did this idea come from? Well, Schofield already admitted in the front writing of his Schofield Bible, the first edition, that he owed a debt of gratitude to Westcott and Hort. So here is Larkin now, and he's reading in the book of Job, the, he talks about the foundation stone, a capstone or head cornerstone. He does it again. He calls it the capstone. And he says, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then he says underneath that, there is no chief cornerstone in architectural construction, but in a building of pyramidal form. And in shape, it is exactly like the building it tops out. In other words, he said, there is no chief, his exact words are, there is no chief cornerstone. It should have said capstone. Here's another one from Larkin's Dispensational Truth. Is Christ the cornerstone of the foundation or the capstone on top of the Masonic Pyramid? Here he says, from what has been said, we see that the Great Pyramid is symbolic of the spiritual building of which Christ is the chief capstone. I have a huge problem with that. And if it causes people to say, I don't like Mike Hoggart, I think he's a heretic, I'm not going along with him, he's a... if that causes you to walk away, I'm sorry, I can't help it. I'm presenting to you exactly what Larkin said, and what he said was wrong. The Bible clearly states that Christ is the chief cornerstone of the foundation. Larkin didn't believe it. He said, there is no such thing. I ought to know, I'm an architect. And so Larkin decided that the Bible, exactly the way it was written, are you hearing me, you King James Bible believers? That the Bible, exactly the way it was written, had an error in it, had several of them actually. Especially in Matthew 24, when they said, you know, when, show us when shall be the end of the world. Larkin said, oh my goodness. Here's what's causing the misinterpretation of everybody who doesn't see it my way. Because really, the, the Bible should not have said world. It should have said ages here. That's what he said. And that's what the premise of his dispensational truth is built upon. The fact that the King James Bible had an error. And that error is causing everybody else to misinterpret the truth. And I'm sorry. But if my Bible says world, I believe world. If my Bible says chief cornerstone, then that is exactly what I believe. And if my Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void instead of became, and here's another thing Larkin does. Every place where he's going to talk about 
the earth being without form and void, he always says the earth became without form and void, not was without form and void. And that's the basis of the gap theory. The idea that the Bible is not right. So he said the, the building that Christ is building is a pyramid and Christ is the all-seeing eye capstone. That's a lie. Here's another one from Larkin's Dispensational Truth. God said the earth had foundations. Larkin says it doesn't have foundations. Look at what he said. He's, see the words, um, he's quoting Job 38, 4. Um, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? And if you skip on down under shouted for joy, here's what Larkin said. Now we know that the earth has no foundations, for it is a sphere and hung upon nothing, as Job well knew. Do you see what he said? The Bible says, God said, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? God said, God, God ought to know, he built it. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Larkin said, now we know that the earth doesn't have a foundation. I won't follow this guy. I won't believe. Now, does he say some things in dispensational truth that are right? Sure, I've read it. Part of it. But as soon as I realized that he was changing the Bible, and then he was trying to teach a doctrine that the new age coming is seen in the pyramid and that he didn't like what the King James Bible had to say so he changed it so now it says what he wants it to say. And in many places in Dispensational Truth you find Larkin rather than quoting from the King James he quotes from the revised version. Why? The King James did not say what he wanted it to say. But other translations did. And I ask the question, would any King James Bible-believing church have some com someone come in to preach behind their pulpit who admitted that they didn't believe the King James was right, that it had errors in it? I would say probably that no, absolutely not. Churches have split over this issue. Why then would fundamental Bible-believing churches, King James Bible-believing churches, use Clarence Larkin's teaching in their classrooms to teach dispensationalism. Why would they do that? It doesn't sound right to me. And anybody who disregards the plain words of the scriptures, if they can deny it in one place, they will deny it in another. Now I'm going to leave you with this. We have much more to talk about. Will you come back next week and listen? That's between you and God. But the facts are the facts. What Larkin was teaching, what he was basing it upon, was not every word of God. He went to other places. Did he know what he was doing? I don't think he was being malicious at all. But his idea and his philosophy concerning the sacred scriptures, the holy writings and the words of God, his attitude toward that lends itself to the idea that he was wrong because he built it upon a faulty and deceptive foundation. So you pray about it, you think about it, don't ask me, ask the scriptures whether these things be true or not. And if I'm wrong and I'm lying, then may God chasten me. But his word is always going to be right in every word that it says, including cornerstone, was without form and void, all of those words, the end of the world, the King James Bible is right in everything that it says. So I'm going to challenge you. Do what God led me to do years ago. Take everything that you think you know and set it aside. Put it away somewhere. And then you go, I believe that God's people should have a pure doctrine. A pure doctrine. You know how you get a pure doctrine? You just read the Bible and say, I don't understand that, but I believe that it's right. 
That's how you get a pure doctrine. You want to know what I believe? I believe that every word of God is pure and it does not need my changing or correction. And if my doctrine um, goes against what the scriptures say, then my doctrine's wrong, not the scriptures. Not the guy who's teaching it to me. The, the scriptures are right 100% of the time. I love you. I love you. I don't want you to be angry. I don't want you to be upset. I don't want you to be mad. But that you would go to the Lord and go to His Word and say, God, show me whether or not my heart is telling the truth. I went, when God began this ministry, laid it in my heart to study prophecy, I went to go see a guy up in St. Louis. He was supposedly one of these prophets that was going to prophesy over St. Louis and tell what God was telling me was, you know, was going to happen. So I went, I well, okay, maybe, and I took notes. I wrote down just about everything that he said as fast as I could in the, in the detail that he said it. He specifically said certain things were going to happen. That was 15 years ago. Never happened. And I left that meeting. God had put enough spirit in me to where I said, God, he sounds like he believes what he's saying, but let God be true and every man a liar. And so God, if what he said is in the Bible, then I want you to show it to me plainly. And that's what I'll believe. But if it's not, let him be a liar, and I will not believe it, and I will not teach it. Sound simple enough? That's what I'm asking you to do. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.